Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line on a Thursday afternoon. We're going to open up the phone lines at 877-753-3341. 877-753-3341 is the phone number if you'd like to call into the program today. And while the legions of people are, are calling in on whatever topics they have in mind that are apologetically relevant anyways, we last evening got notification of the provision of the um, recordings of the debate with Graham Codrington in Johannesburg, South Africa from two weeks ago tomorrow. Yeah, sort of like that. Maybe actually a little less than that because it's nine hours, but you know, two weeks ago from tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, um, looks like they're pretty good quality. Like I said, it was a good venue. Uh, the, the the church was, when we first walked in, I was a little worried because they're having a, having a heat wave and most places just do not have what they call air con. Um, most places abbreviate things shorter than we do in the United States. I'm just a weird, weird thing. You know, to rent, to let, um, elevator lift, um, air conditioning, air con. Anyway, um, but we walked in and I heard somebody say, let's turn on the air conditioning. I'm like, yes. So it ended up being a, uh, a comfortable uh, context for the debate. And so what I'm going to do while <clears throat> Rich struggles to keep up with all the phone calls at 877 877- Seven five three 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 four one. He looks like he's losing it in there, just trying to keep everybody. You know, you might try saying it slower. One, please eight, seven, call seven. <laughs> at. You mean like that? Eight seven 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 five three 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 four one. There's there's three threes in there. Anyway, um, while uh, we line folks up, uh, or. I queue up John Denver music <laughs> too. <laughs> um, I thought I would play a portion of the debate. This was the portion where I got to ask questions of Dr. Codrington. Um, this wasn't the audience questions, but this was the actual where two of us get to uh, go back and forth. And so here is uh, not quite two weeks ago, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, myself, and Graham Codrington. That's it? Zero. Okay. <laughs> Dr. White, your turn. Dr. Codrington, in Ezekiel 16.50, the singular toe va is used. Why do you not view that as having to do with homosexuality, especially in light of the use of toe va uh, in the Levitical law? Toevai, as I understand it, and I know you're a, a better Hebrew scholar than I am, but Toevai, as I understand it, is uh, simply something that is uh, uh, defiling, is an abomination, is, is something that is aberrant to God. And when we look at e Ezekiel, and if, if you have your Bibles, why don't you go there and have a look at Ezekiel 16, 49, and 50, it lists a number of sins, and then the, the phrase I'm using, the New Living uh, Translation, as I read here, it talks about the loathsome things uh, that, that I believe that's uh, what we're talking about there. Yeah, but and it's not a good translation. It's translating into plural. It's a singular. It's the toeva. What is the toeva in light of? If we interpret Ezekiel yeah. as having knowledge of the Mosaic Code, what is the toeva? Which, which of the sexual sins is des described as toeva? Uh, I think a lot of them are described as it and a lot in of other things. In and the Holiness Code? And a lot of other things are described as Toeva as well. So you don't know what it's the Toeva is? Thing. Okay. You don't know what the Toeva is. I, I just need to know if you, if you knew what it was. Um, you said you believe that Moses would have interpreted his words the way you do. So, so you believe that Israelites, that two male Israelites could have gone to, gone to Moses and say, we want to live together as married people uh, faithfully, and Moses would have said, hot dog, let's do it. That's an Americanism, I'm sorry. No, that's uh, fine, I fully understand that, 
fully understand that. I'm not sure Moses would have said precisely that. No, I, I get what you're the saying. The Hebrew version of it. I get yeah. there must the be kosher some, hot dog. There must be like kosher, uh, uh, some, some, yeah, yeah. yeah. Being a beef hot dog at least. Yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Look, it, that's a great question, and it's an important question, because I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't have. And I think that's what Romans 1 is about. Because the Jewish culture had a very particular, and we might even today use the word prudish view of sexuality, even prudish view of their bodies, which they still do today. I, I live in a very orthodox Jewish community, and we still see the full covering for both men and women. And so, all, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek put my hand up to your question earlier, but it's a fair question in response to that. I think m that Moses may have had the response that Paul had in Romans 1 to say these things are shameful, that these things are things which are culturally unacceptable. And I think that he probably would have had the same response that Paul, the rabbi, uh, would have had, which is to say, don't do things that are going to be a stumbling block to other people. Don't put stumbling blocks in the place of other people. So to pause your question slightly, I think theologically he may have said I think this is fine. Well, I mean, he was speaking scripture, he was speaking God's word, so he would have said, this is fine. I think he probably would have said to the people, don't do it. I, and I, I'm give, not trying to you avoid your question. Can you anything from Moses to substantiate that other than your feelings? No, I'm giving you what I think Paul has helped us in the rabbinic tradition to understand about the difference between something that is evil and something that is shameful. And I think um, that's an important distinction. What is a degrading passion? Uh, in what context? Romans chapter 1, he describes, it's the introduction to the discussion of homosexuality. It's a degrading passion. Well, it's the introduction to the whole passage, actually, um, not just oh. to the passage. So, so I, here's how I see Romans 1 playing out, very simply. That there are people here who are uh, against God, who are opposed to God. And what happens in the, in, in the way in which that opposition to God demonstrates itself is they first of all start to worship other gods. They start to put things in front of God. Then they begin to descend into culturally unacceptable practices. And they move from those into things that are demonstrably evil and, and murderous and all of those things. And they eventually descend down to having no mercy, no empathy, no love no humanity about them at all. And I think there's a clear progression as you read through Romans 1 of how that happens. If degrading pra passions is, is therefore part of the heading of that, that's how the degrading of the passions happens. From turning away from God to doing things that are shameful to doing things that are evil to having your entire humanity stripped away from you. I think that's a good description of what a degrading passion is. And yet... Uh, the, the reason I asked specifically uh, is that this is the therefore of verse 24. So it's, it's, it's smack dab in the middle. It's not a header. Mm -hmm. And it says, therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And then you have the exchanging of truth for a lie. And then finally you get a 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Yeah. So you don't see anything here about these are the made in the image of God, but these are passions that degrade the image of God. You just see this as, you, where, where does the term cultural appear here? That's what I, the, the shameful. So the things that are shameful. Uh, the, what term is that? Animatai. Or animai, sorry, in the Greek. The things that are shameful in what, that they, in, in what they were doing. I think Paul is showing a progression in Romans 1. A progression that, that leads them into things that are, first of all, shameful, and then things that are evil. And, and the way we understand this is when we turn to chapter 2. Paul's going to then say to the Jews, look, I, I've painted this picture. I've painted a, a picture of the evil, nasty Gentiles. But be careful of how you judge. Please go and read uh, the first few verses of chapter 2. Be careful, Jews, how you judge these people. Be careful that you are not judged in the same way uh, that you have judged them. And then he's going to go on to talk about circumcision, which is their shameful act as far as the Gentiles were concerned. And he's then eventually going to, in chapter 3, get to the point of saying, we're all in this position. We're all in a position where we are capable of very quickly moving away from God. 
and all of us are in need of God. So the phrase, pathe atamias, degrading passions, you say that's simply something that's shameful culturally, that it's not reflective of a exchange of the truth of God for a lie? If they're doing it in a cultic context, if they're doing it in the Where, temple... Where's, where's the cultic context here in, in, in Romans 1? Uh, you pretty much pick it up from 18 to 24, just as you've read it. Were they making little I, I went through 18 to 20, I went through 18 and following in my time, and I never had to use the term cultic once. Could you show um, me where it's found in the text itself? Yeah, uh, verse 23, is that good enough? Instead of worshipping the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people or birds or animals or snakes. Okay. So God let them go ahead with their degrading passions. And so the, exactly the context, right? So the, 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 the futility of the minds and the darkening of the understanding, this is only within cultic worship. No, there's a progression that's going. It's the, the same sentence. The progression is that they move away from God God gives them over. This is actually the, the punishment that comes from God, is that God allows people to do the things that they want to do. It's a very scary uh, passage here of Scripture, uh, that God allows you to, to do the things that you want to do. And those shameful things become evil things, become things that completely eat you out from the inside. So when does the cultic context end? I think it's all the way through, so but different the, commentators would argue that in different ways. So, so all the sins uh, mentioned, so uh, if, if you're greedy in the temple, that's bad, but if you're greedy outside the temple, that's okay? No, because there's a change in, in word here. He goes from calling things shameful uh, to calling things evil. And you can see that in verse 28. So when they refused to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their evil minds. He now uses the word evil instead of degrading or shameful. And it then repeats, and it let them do the things they shouldn't have done. Can you and lexically demonstrate what you're saying, that, 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 that those terms are not at all semantically related to one another? Yes, I can, and I don't From have who? that in my, in my head, unfortunately. Uh, not being a, a Greek scholar as yourself, okay, all right. but you can certainly find right, it on, see, on then, my website. Then let's do it this way. Um, do you see in verse 28, it says, God paradidomi, paradokin, the, 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 uh, the aorist form, right? Yep. God gave them over. Didn't that appear earlier in the same? Well, how about verse 26? For this reason, God did what? Paradokin, yeah, but, but gave them the, over. But that's precisely the point I'm making. Paul is showing this progression. Each time God gives them over to the next layer of progression towards complete and utter annihilation of their humanity. <coughs> so, so that we get to the, to the end of this here. They refuse to understand, break their promises, heartless. They are fully aware uh, of this death penalty. They go right ahead and do it anyway. So, and that's what he's moving towards. And then in the next verse, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, mm -hmm. he's going to turn around and hit his readers and say, but you do the same things. Even though you possess the word of God, that's true. But so what you're saying is disobedient to parents in verse 30 is farther down the progression than the, uh, the uh, degrading passions a few verses earlier. That's the only yes. way we can, it is. I would agree with that. Okay. Which is why I don't believe that homosexuality is as much of a problem as you do. Okay, fantastic. Uh, uh, again. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, I thought I had popped those back up. That's, uh, Rudolph's favorite term, fantastic, uh, or 100%, 100%, that's a 100%. Uh, it was, <laughs> I, I was laughing at that during it. It's like, why, why is that fantastic? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's just a transitionary statement yes. <laughs> uh, on, uh, on his part, so, um, so there you have, it was only 10 minutes. Uh, he had had 10 minutes, I had 10 minutes. I don't remember how long the audience questions were. Um, some of them were pretty interesting uh, because uh, Rudolph put it, they put his phone number up on, the, um, up on the screen. And so you texted questions to his phone. And um, 
some of them just were not suitable for a public um, airing, shall we say? It was uh, it was it was interesting. But um, anyway, we uh, have the videos downloaded, and so I imagine it's just a matter of. Uh, well, fortunately, because this is all essentially functioning as a single camera shoot uh, for us, because they've already done the camera uh, work between right. the different cameras and shifted them live. Uh, I don't really have to do a whole lot of editing and drop uh, some titles in, and uh, it should render, hopefully, uh, have it ready by the middle of next week. Middle of next week? Yeah. I don't know. It seemed to it seemed to go faster just a few months ago. Oh, you're you're a funny guy. Well, well, you know, we'll we'll see if it's if it comes before that. That's great. Uh, so it's just just trying to remember how this works, right? Yes, I'm trying. Well, there is that I'm trying to remember how this works. Yeah, it's a, a new uh, a new task on my plate all over again. <clears throat> uh huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Just all right. Good. Didn't take me as long to prepare for the debate as anyway. Oh, uh... oh, oh ouch. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, right along those lines, before we go to the, the billions of phone calls that we have uh, waiting online at 877-753-3341, <clears throat> um, this morning, uh, well, when was it? Uh, Monday or Tuesday, Janet Mefford uh, posted a review of the new Alan Chambers book. Now, if you don't know who Alan Chambers is... Alan Chambers was the last president of Exodus International. And uh, he's the one that closed it down and uh, apologized to all the homosexuals that they had hurt and uh, has now put this book out. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I... When, when it ended, I was like, that, that's it? I, it? It's done? Because um, I was listening to it this morning. I, I, went on a, I did a long ride, and I knew it wasn't all that long a book, about 200 pages, I think, it said in Kindle. And I still had a distance to go when it, uh, it finished, and I'm... I was hearing some uh, some some ways of contacting Alan Chambers, uh, Facebook and stuff like that, and I was wondering, well, what I don't get what this has to do with where we are in the book. And then it moved on. That was it. It was done. And what was not anywhere in the book was any, absolutely any interaction with the biblical text at all. Nothing. It was nothing but his life story up to this point. Um, getting married and... But, but even then, it just seemed horribly incomplete. And just... just I don't even know how to respond to it. To be honest, I, don't even know, I wouldn't even know how to, rev how to review it. Um, to be honest with you. Uh, because it just, there just wasn't anything there. Uh, there were so many questions that most of us would have that just weren't asked or answered in, in the book. It was, I, I, I don't recall it being very expensive, but don't really think I got my money's worth out of it, that's for sure. So I expected, you know, at least another round of revisionist argumentation and you know i i discovered that my understanding of these texts and biblical sexuality had been wrong and it just wasn't there just wasn't there so hard to hard to even uh even know how, what to say about it other than wow that was fluffy um it just wasn't wasn't much there uh to to respond to now, obviously, Alan Chambers is, you know, the favorite of the quote-unquote gay Christian movement because, well, here's here's proof. You you can't cease being gay. It's just it's just the way you are. It's the way you're born. Um, that's it. That's it. And I've not heard him speak on the subject, 
maybe he's better in that forum than the written forum, but I was not was not impressed uh, at all with the uh, with the uh, the book itself. There just really wasn't anything there. Really wasn't anything there. So a little disappointing along those lines. Um, but I'm sure it'll get lots of press, uh, anyways. So a bunch of you decided to jump online we actually are filled up now that's uh that's impressive haven't had that happen in a while so let's get started uh and let's uh talk to craig in new york hi craig hey dr wade i'm really appreciative to be on the line with you i really enjoy your debates and you hear lots of callers give you all feel like that but i really do mean it <laughs> okay and my question to get to the point is I'm a Reformed Baptist, but I really like to read church history, and I have a lot of questions about the, the priesthood in its nascent form. Okay. And particularly, it appears that Ambrose and Chrysostom in the 4th century make references to the priesthood being a function of forgiving sins. Now, like, do you have any comments on just how that developed doctrinally in the early church? Well, have you seen my debate with uh, Mitch Paqua on the subject? Yes, I did, and quite frankly, I think um, Mr. Paqua had so little information and really didn't even substantiate anything about history. I did like the well, I did like the comment I did like the comment about Mrs. Paqua, though. Yeah, that's true, moment. but he did he did make the assertion, and and it's 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 primarily the assertion that is made uh, that um, what you have happening uh, in an evolutionary sense is uh, the transformation of the term presbyteros into yep, a meaning that it, it could never have in any meaningful New Testament study, uh, but over time it becomes the foundation for the distinction between uh, episkopos, uh, uh, bishop, or pastor, um, and certainly what you have as the church enters into a period of time where uh, tradition is going to become more and more important, um, and the distinction between the church and the synagogue in the sense of forgetting Old Testament backgrounds, uh, allegorical interpretation, the impact of origin, um, you start seeing this in the 4th century writers, into the 5th century writers, and as a result, you start getting these unbiblical concepts that are just flowing from the fact that as the church becomes normative and no longer persecuted, um, or even, and, and it started before that, as, as the... Uh, like with Cyprian. Uh, well, yeah, and even, even during periods before that, there is going to be a pressure upon the church to abandon biblical norms for what would be considered um, proper religious perspectives, which would include um, a, a complicated church hierarchy, priesthoods. That's what people are expecting religions to have. Uh, certainly, that's exactly what happened, and you know, we were warned about it in the in the Old Testament. And you start seeing the same thing happening as far as uh, the development of the Anchorite movement, the Desert Fathers uh, in Egypt, um, the rise of monasticism, and hence the, the creation of a priesthood. And you also... I mean, I, best, I'm sorry. I, th I think it also comes with the fact that the, the book that would be the most uh, counteractive to this movement would be Hebrews. And there just seems to be, because of its deep connection to the Old Testament scriptures and the uh, rise of allegorical interpretation, they're just Hebrews just did not seem to function for many people as what you'd call first-level scripture. Because if you don't understand the, the backgrounds, then you're really not going to find the argumentation of Hebrews to be compelling. And I've, I've uh, lamented that uh, many, many times, and I think this is an area that 
uh, just as in the degradation of the view of atonement, uh, likewise the concept of priesthood, very clearly addressed in Hebrews. There's only one high priest. He holds his priesthood operabiton without succession. Uh, the idea of a of another priesthood, the necessity of another priesthood, uh, very thoroughly refuted by what you have uh, in the book of Hebrews. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a period of time where you have a, a lot of transitions taking place, and um, if you if you do not have a view of sola scriptura, then you're going to be really confused as to what you're supposed to end up doing, because uh, those who would say, well, see, you need to have the tradition of the church, uh, now they're stuck with Francis, and uh, who knows where that's going to go. Um, but, um, if, uh, if I, I mean, I mean, I mean that, that, that could have been another subject today uh, because of what's going on. I've got a bunch of articles. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, but the stuff with Francis and this uh, this synod in Rome and the, the issues of sexuality and marriage, wow, it's... Um, Fascinating stuff. But anyways, um, you know, as I said in the debate with Paqua, this is this is a clear issue where once again, if if that which is Theanustas is normative, then you simply cannot have the priesthood concept because it's not there. Um, Paul gives us clear ecclesiology in regards to two offices. And the one that becomes central in Roman Catholicism, he never says a word about. So it's one of those many places where you have to deny sola scriptura uh, to be able to hold to the Roman Catholic perspective on these things because it's it's a thoroughly unbiblical office. Now, pertaining to the office, seeing that there were people that were saved third, fourth, fifth centuries when the when it really started evolving. That's the that's the part that sort of uh that sort of bothers me thinking about how clearly it's so unbiblical that a priest has the, the ability to forgive and to retain sins. And yet that was mainstream doctrine during that time. I mean, what if a Protestant denomination taught that today? I mean, could people be saved believing that? Well, people can be saved believing a lot of things. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why anybody thinks perfection of theology is the standard of salvation. The gospel is fairly straightforward. Um, it, I'm not sure what you, what you mean by that. I mean, um, I, I know I, Anglicans that refer to their ministers as, as priests. Um, I certainly would never do that. Um, I think it's dangerous. I think it can lead to all sorts of issues. Just look at Anglicanism today. That should give you enough warning uh, as far as uh, the mainstream view. Not the conservative guys down Sydney, but um, but it, that's not a part of the gospel. Uh, so I mean, it's not it's not defined somewhere as um, you know. We have certain things that we are told. If you got a false gospel, anathema. If you got the wrong Jesus, no salvation. Uh, okay, central things. You know, deny the resurrection, incarnation, and out. Um, but it does seem we live in a day where where people think that, yeah, so if there's any difference that could possibly maybe lead down the road to a major thing, then psh, you're you're out of the kingdom. and and i I've never quite understood exactly how that how that works. Um, was there a great rise in nominalism? Was there a, a tremendous number of people who would be uh, identified as Christians outwardly who weren't? Sure. Um, does that mean that every person who ever believed somebody was a priest is, is automatically lost? No. Um, I, I mean, suppose, I, I would suppose the issue more so is in Galatians that even believing that, you know, to add circumcision atop the gospel undoes the gospel and it's anathema. So to add that in order to have your sins forgiven, it must be mediated between a man seems perilously close to, to, adding something to the gospel, which makes it a non-gospel. Well, if you're talking about a someone actually stating that the only way of salvation is for forgiveness through a particular form of the priesthood, but I doubt you're going to find any of them saying that. They're going to see it as a means God uses, but they're going to make a very clear distinction between saying uh, this is a part of the gospel and necessary and the only way that w in, in which God forgives 
um, and, and, and anything else. So I, I mean, sure. Yeah. If, if someone wants to say that the only way of salvation is through this priesthood, then yeah, that would definitely, uh, take you to that, that, that perspective. And that's what Rome certainly has done today, but that's something that took a, a lot of development, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of time for that to, uh, uh, to come together, you find you find inconsistencies in all of these people, and so because uh, they're not God. I'm sorry, they're not they're not God. So well, but the point is, as, right. as 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 unbiblical traditions develop, um, you know, you know, people. That's why I don't a lot of these books that you'll buy that say, well, this unbiblical doctrine developed at this time, and and this one at this time, and and a lot of the books on Roman Catholicism are filled with stuff like that. It didn't work that way. It's not how history works. And it's not like everybody woke up one morning and, oh, we have a new doctrine now, and so everybody who believes it is now lost. Um, no, you had, you had inconsistencies as these unbiblical traditions became more and more popular over time, eventually necessitating uh, the Reformation itself. But the Reformers recognized that the... Uh, the idea that well nobody before us was ever saved um, was not a was not a tenable or or uh, even biblical position. It just seems to me that like when Ambrose is writing against the Donatist, he one of the things he takes issue with is that the Donatists reject the idea that sins are forgiven through the Catholic Church, and he actually speaks specifically about that in the thirty third paragraph, chapter seven on on the priesthood, and then. And so I don't want to get into detail because you don't know what questions those callers are coming up with, and you can't have all. Well, no, no. It, 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 again, no. This is just something I've talked about many times before. Uh, uh, as BB Warfield said, the Reformation inwardly considers nothing more than the victory of Augustine's doctrine of grace over Augustine's doctrine of the Church. And when Augustine doc uh, argued against the Donatists. Um, what he argued there was very much formational for later Roman Catholic teachings. Same thing with Ambrose when arguing against the Donatists on ecclesiastical issues. You're going to have that kind of stuff. You're also going to find places where Ambrose is going to give a very clear grace presentation. So what I'm saying is they're inconsistent. Um, no, I, I would, I would so, agree, and I think a lot of it arises out of the fact that uh, the Church became a state religion in the Roman Empire. Well, yeah, and now and they have all these nominal believers coming in, so they needed visible forms of penance, visible forms of confession, and things to that effect to even know who really was a Christian anymore. <laughs> yeah, and that's discussed uh, pretty well in, in the book um, Reformers and Their Stepchildren, uh, that uh, especially goes through the development of the Donatist controversy and sacralism and, and all the things that came with that. Um, it'd be a good good book to look at. Craig, thank you very much for your phone call thank today. You. All righty, we're going to move on here and talk with uh, Jeff in Philadelphia. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing, Dr. White? Uh, I, uh, your your phone uh, screener guy told me not to give a big report, but I just wanted to say thank you for all your help. Um, our outreach during the World Meeting of Families and the Pope's visit went very well, and uh, a lot of your influence uh, was there. And uh, <laughs> um, so I wanted to thank you, and thank you for getting me in touch with Chris Arns, and that was very helpful, too. Wow, someone actually thanked me for getting 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 someone in touch with Chris Arnzen. That's normally normally I'm getting blamed for that. It's, uh, but anyway, I I actually was got to go to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and meet him. So in the flat. Well, there you go. So There's he's not just a myth. He is no no the man, the myth, the legend, the Chris Arnzen. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. So anyway. now, now someone's calling him. Oh, good. It's actually a different Chris. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay good. Um, so I wanted to, um, uh, besides thanking you for all that, um, I had a couple, uh, I guess, through a lot of interactions online and in person with Catholics, I had a few things. Uh, wh one of the things that I popped up repeatedly was pretty much uh, every, even religious Catholics, um, the vast majority don't think there's a difference between us about justification, and it takes a very long time to convince them. You have to be, I was talking to a priest for like 10 minutes before he's like, oh! And then he gave me the uh, anticipated objection of uh, Romans 6.1, and I was like, this should not take this long with someone who went to seminary, but 
Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of, um, uh, I saw something you posted uh, maybe a few days ago, after, right after the debate, and I encountered this online with um, um, a religious Catholic, where it seemed like they had a pretty low view uh, compared to us of Scripture. Like, you know, they believe basically archaeology didn't really support much, um, that the Bible was filled with contradictions, but they were like a devout Catholic. And I kind of some of that was in your debate, one of your debates on the Apocrypha, when you were bringing up that there was historical errors in the Apocrypha. Oh, yeah. And then I was like, there, there seemed to be a link between that and, you know, Jesus explicitly has a very high view of Scripture in the Gospel. And, um, and it seems like uh, there's a tie-in with what, ha- I guess, the... Uh, I didn't know if you went. I missed the first few minutes of your uh, pres- um, of the dividing line today, but uh, where I guess your debate opponent tried to say that Jesus just was limited by his humanity and didn't um, understand. I'm, I'm not, you must be talking about the Gagnon Kirk debate. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, maybe that was the Gagnon Kirk debate. Oh. Okay, maybe that was the Gagnon Kirk debate. Yes, I, I saw you posted something about it on on uh, social media. Um, where that Jesus is limited by his humanity, so he wasn't aware <laughs> that he was wrong about homosexuality or something like that. Right. And yeah. kind of, I, I would assume the Catholics have to take a a similar position on Jesus' view of Scripture, since Jesus had a very high view of Scripture in Scripture, in, in the Gospel. Well, I didn't, uh, yeah. I'm... So well... the question is, is, like, how do you tackle someone who's saying, no, Jesus is is that limited by his humanity? Not that he just doesn't know the day or the hour of the second coming. He he's completely off base about like whether Jonah actually happened or or you know Genesis one and two, et cetera. Well, there there certainly isn't any um, official Roman Catholic uh, doctrine that would give any basis for what Daniel Kirk said, um, but. Obviously, there's just as wide a variety of viewpoints amongst Roman Catholics as there is amongst anyone else, which is what makes right. the argument that uh, Patrick Madrid makes about Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura being the blueprint for anarchy such a such a laugh is that uh, Rome has just as wide a variety of perspectives, and I would not be surprised at all if the current pope would not be friendly toward expressions of um, limited knowledge on the part of Christ in regards to him being just an idealized man. He He's very, very, very friendly with very liberal forms of theology. So, but he hasn't said so, uh, you, you can't, can't really go there. But uh, the, the point is, you, you, there is no single our Roman Catholic view of Scripture, right. and okay. when you try to define the dogmatic statements, that's not in any way going to reflect, um, especially the people that you meet in the street, because Rome, it, it, it's it's just like walking into a Christian bookstore. You, you run into one guy who's reading Benny Hinn, and one guy who reads, who's reading Karl Barth, and and uh, never shall the twain meet, uh, as far as being able to figure out any consistency. And uh, Roman Catholicism, just as wide a spectrum of things, if not wider in some in some fashion, actually, because there's so much cultural Catholicism. Um, so in terms, but I understand that in terms of people you do run into with that kind of view, either within the Roman Communion or about the uh, homosexual issue. Uh, like, how would you um, just defend that, that Jesus wasn't so limited by the Incarnation that he, he you know, was basically making ver- those sort of errors? Well, I, I don't think Dr. Kirk believes in an Incarnation. Um, from what I've read, it seems he believes Jesus is an idealized man and that what we are getting in the Gospels is a, uh, is a mythical uh, presentation that Jesus was just a guy. Uh, he was just a great religious leader, but he was just a guy. Uh, so, historic concepts of incarnation, 
that kind of level of supernaturalism and things like that, I don't think would be would be relevant. Um, you know, someone who has has gotten to the point of believing that Jesus is just a man is someone who who doesn't even believe the um, the historical testimony of the apostles themselves, because it's painfully clear from Mark onward that you cannot squish Jesus down to those parameters without ignoring what Mark says. I mean, climax of Mark's gospel, Jesus stands before the high priest and quotes from Psalm 110 and uh, Daniel 7 and says, I'm the son of man and who is given a kingdom and is uh, those and his people give him Latrua, they give him the highest form of worship, and the high priest tears his robe and says, what more need do we have of testimony? You've heard the blasphemy, he's worthy to die. So uh, from the earliest uh, strata of tradition that we have, uh, all the way through all the Gospels, you have the deity of Christ being presented. So once you, once you abandon that, <clears throat> there's really no reason to have a religious discussion any longer about homosexuality because they don't have a religious basis upon which to have it anymore. They don't have a revelation. Uh, it's now just going to be a matter of uh, which scholars you choose and which social scientists you read and, and uh, you know, whatever the cultural flow is. Uh, it, it, there's really no no basis for having any further discussion at that point because you don't have any revelation upon which to stand. Okay, that makes the yeah, I, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I mean, at least the response I had was kind of that, you know, Jesus, I just pointed to Jesus in the scriptures and just uh, at least with the Roman Catholic knew like, well, his view of scripture was a lot higher than yours. Oh yeah, well, there's no there question really about that. I mean, to... yeah, I mean, yeah. you have to you have to tell people. It, it, it's strikingly strange uh, that you would call yourself a Christian while claiming to be wiser than the one you claim to follow. Right. And they'll yeah. normally look at you and go, "Well, well, 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 what do you mean?" Well, Jesus's view of Scripture is significantly different than your own, and yet. Why would you why would you say that your eternal salvation is dependent upon him, but you're smarter than him when it comes to even understanding the origination of scripture itself? Uh, what could you explain that? And no one can. Uh, because it's it's incoherent idiocy, but that's that's what we are facing today uh, in in dealing with folks. So anyways, glad you guys were out there and uh, I'm sure you had some some fascinating, conversations uh would have been would have been interesting to be there but uh unfortunately uh, well, it was smack dab between uh, overseas trips just did not work out well uh yeah i'm not sure when the next time the catholics are having a convention but the democrats are coming to town next summer so that could be worse to... that that actually could be worse yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's um, right, that that could be downright violent so anyways yeah, we're, Jeff, uh, thanks. We're, we're, we're we're planning to be out there for that too so all, all right righty. thanks jeff all right god bless all right bye. bye bye all right let's talk with uh charlie hi charlie uh hi dr white uh i just want to uh, really quick to say thank you so much for your ministry uh it's been a, an incredible blessing um i want to thank rich rich thank you for keeping dr white in line and busy <laughs> and, you know uh dragging him away from his bike in order to keep the DL going. Oh, oh. Uh, well, thankfully, he's talking to the next caller. He can't hear what you're saying anyways, so. Okay, good, good. Um, so uh, I might be digging up bones here, but um, after your debate with Professor Flowers, I kind of began listening to uh, Soteriology 101 just to kind of get a feel for his position. <laughs> Why? I mean, I, I mean, just uh, your, your life is that... <laughs> Don't don't hang up on me. Um, no, I'm not gonna hang up on you. I just might want to try to help you, you know, get a better focus on life, or you know, find a find a girlfriend, something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm married. I'm married. Well, so, uh, I don't, okay, don't so need a so so your wife allowed you to do this. I think we need to talk to her. I, I yeah, think, yeah, we, we mm -hmm. need to. We might need to pray about this. Um, okay. But uh, I've only listened to a few, and really, I mean, you only need to listen to one because he has his few points, which he beats on every episode. This is true. Um, but I wanted to ask you about his uh, his charge against compatibilism 
and God having these contradictory <laughs> wills, uh, according to him. And I was wondering if you'd give your thoughts on maybe flipping the charge on him, because, you know, he'll say God has one will, and uh, that is the de- desire that all people, um, you know, be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, <clears throat> um, even irregardless of Second Timothy 2.25, if he just keeps reading on. Uh, but out of the other side of his mouth, he'll, uh, he'll say, you know, enough down the conversation, he'll say, uh, He'll stress essentially God's priority uh, in creation was essentially preserving man's freedom, yeah. which allows man to choose outside of God's decree and against it. So, um, so I mean, that just seems to me like he hasn't really assessed his own position enough. If he has desire one of God, you know, um, absolutely, if he absolutely desires uh, equally every man head for head be saved, desire to, you know, God desires for creatures that could outwill his former desire. And I'm not sure which Professor Flowers would put first, um, if at all, or if you'd say that they are compatible. Um, but uh, I was just wondering what your what your thoughts would be. On well, that. I I have not found Leighton's um, theology or philosophy to be particularly coherent. Um, it is very clear to me that Leighton Flowers has a a particular conclusion that he he needs to get to. And the theological, philosophical, and especially exegetical path by which he will arrive at that conclusion can be incredibly circuitous, tortured, and impossible to map out. And hence, almost impossible to critique, uh, because it's just, there's no consistency to it, other than... I'm going to get here, and I'm going to get here anywhere, any way that I, that I can. Right. So, in talking about election, he'll go one direction, and doing Romans 9, it's another direction, and John 6, it's another direction. So it's all, it's all over, the, over the map, and that's why I don't think he can point to anyone in church history that's actually held his views mm-hmm. consistently across the spectrum. He might be able to point, well, this guy agreed with me on this, and that guy agrees with me on that, but as a system... Don't think so. I don't think I've I've encountered anyone that's that's uh, that's done that, other than maybe some some people on a very surface level. But it's 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 painfully obvious to me um, that for for Leighton, uh, we're not talking about a system of theology that is derived from the exegesis of the text of Scripture. We're talking about a system that has specific commitments to get to the end goal of affirming um, a, a free will theism, and then and you, the you, you grab what you have to grab uh, to make that sound uh, possible to the particular audience that, that he's trying to communicate with, which is, which at least for a long time has been primarily a Southern Baptist audience. Uh, maybe he's expanding beyond that or, or something along those lines. But uh, again, and I said it in the debate, say it again, the difference between us is very clearly the difference between a man-centered theology and a God-centered theology. I mean, it is really a a focus upon God's purposes being wrapped up in man and a focus upon God's purposes being wrapped up in God. Uh, which right. I don't know how you can read um, the Psalter or Isaiah or Jeremiah uh, or pretty much anything else and come to the conclusion that God's first and foremost primary concern has to do with the creation rather than the creator himself and what his intentions are in glorifying himself in the creation. It, there seem to be some comments he made in our debate uh, where he really does bristle at the idea uh, right. that, that God's uh, self-glorification is central. And I just go, there you go, folks. There's, there's the difference between us is um, if, if man's glorification and man's free will and, and so on, if that's central, I know some other people believe that. Uh, I recall a section out of the Doctrine and Covenants that says God's purpose and glory is bringing about the immortality of man. But that was Joseph Smith, so we probably right. don't want to go there. But uh, right. I think Joseph Smith got that from someplace, and he got it from the Arminians of his day. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear, like, I mean, 
Professor Flowers or whoever whoever else, because I mean I've heard you, you know, quite a few times. You always say it's the issue between um, a man-centered or a, a God-centered view. But I, I would be interested to hear like a conversation about like looking at the view of who like who can biblically defend the position about um, whose will will be accomplished, like the scripture affirm that, that man is able to accomplish his desires over the creators, or, or do we have, you know, a plethora of verses speaking to God's uh, power and ability to bring about his own desires? Yeah, I, I don't even um, think there's a... You know, he, he might actually be willing to do something like that, to be honest with you, but man, I'll tell you, if, if, you're, a, if, you, if you're wise, you, you don't want to go there, because there's so much about man's inability and so much about man's uh, God's ability that, uh, wow, it, it would be hard to even even imagine how someone could uh, uh, engage that debate. But anyway, mm -hmm. hey, uh, brother, we've got two more calls to try to get to before the end of the hour. I appreciate your phone call. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. All right, bye-bye. All right, let's get to Vincent. Hi, Vincent. Hey, Dr. White. How you doing? Um, look, uh, you mentioned in one, of, in one of your recent debates that the Debater held to the New Covenant theology view. Um, no. Can you explain what aspect <laughs> of that that might lead to that kind of compromise on, on like homosexuality and yeah, other um, issues? What I said was Graham Codrington uh, expresses what I call a, a hyper New Covenant theology perspective, where he, uh, in essence, says that there is nothing in the Mosaic Law, nothing in the Old Covenant uh, that is binding upon us today. Period. End of discussion. If it is not repeated in a New Covenant document, it's irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. So uh, all the quote-unquote cultic stuff of Leviticus, Leviticus 18.20, anything you derive from what happens uh, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, um, anything related to Mosaic Law, it's all irrelevant it's it's it has nothing to do with new covenant believers whatsoever it has to be repeated in new covenant uh texts and he says that very clearly i got all you gotta do is go to uh futurechurchnow.com i think is his uh, blog and read the sections on leviticus and it's right there and i call that a hyper new covenant perspective because he he just he really does basically say uh, it's it's a black and white issue. There's there can be no uh, no discussion about this. Now there are new covenant guys that have gone there well before him. I'm thinking of one new covenant guy a few years ago that uh, decided to say that um, it would be okay for um, uh, brothers to marry sisters uh, because there's nothing in the new covenant scriptures that say otherwise. Uh, and uh, so it's sort of like, well, okay, he's not the first one to have gone there. And of course, from my perspective. It, it's just, sorry, but it's so obvious in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 um, that the Apostle Paul held the church in Corinth accountable for understanding that incestuous relationships were wrong based upon Leviticus 18. Uh, there, Jesus didn't have to repeat it. He didn't have to uh, sit there and say, okay, I'm going to start repeating everything from the moral law because, um, you know, even though I say that Anyone who teaches anyone to break the least of these commandments, the least of the kingdom of God, actually, I need to repeat everything if it's going to be binding. I, I, I really have a problem with that. It, it, it clearly does not work out that well in the New Testament, but there are those that have gone there. So it was Graham Codrington, the guy we just played the clip from at the beginning of the program. And if you look at his blog articles, that's what he was saying is basically until Matthew... It's not relevant when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, moral law, or anything like that. Of course, I go, Thank you. New Covenant, hmm, what's the prophecy of the New Covenant? I will write my law upon their hearts. What law would that be? Uh, well, it would be one they'd never heard of before. Um, okay, I, I, have, I have a problem with that. But that's who it was. All right, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. Much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, dropped the, uh, just dropped the last caller. Sorry about that. Call back in real quick. I apologize. Um, I had one call at the top and one call at the bottom, and the cursor moved, and I messed up. I apologize. It was a call on compatibilism, 
And we got to get it on because you even took the time to spell compatibilism correctly, even though you had originally spelled it wrong. You went back and spelled it correctly. So that means we've got to get it on. Is that is that the call there? <clears throat> and I don't even know who was it, Chris? Hi, Chris. Hey, Dr. White. Sorry How are about you? that. Yes, sir. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Uh, I actually was going to ask you a question on compatibilism uh, based on Second Samuel twelve eleven, um, where the Lord says that I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. Do you think that would be a good text to take somebody to who doesn't quite understand this yet? Well, you you got to be careful uh, uh, beating anybody over the head. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> um. What you have there is definitely a statement from Yahweh. Behold, I'll raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So, um, now, obviously, that's a judgment um, passage. Um and so, while that's relevant and it was fulfilled, there are also judgment pronouncements that God chooses not to follow through on Okay. in mercy. So, I would say it would be better to um, look at those texts where you have uh, God's decree being fulfilled in such a way that he brings good out of what men choose for evil. And so I, I don't think you can make heads or tails out of the Old Testament narrative if you don't understand God's sovereignty and, and God's decree. It's just, it's all over the place. But that's why I've primarily focused upon the Joseph story in Genesis 50, or Isaiah 10 and the Assyrians, or, or the cross story in Acts 4, is because those seem to be the clearest compatibilistic texts because it's not just blessings and cursings, judgment's going to come if you do this, but God very often withheld that judgment. No, in these instances, these are things that God brought about that the people involved could not have known at the time that they were fulfilling God's will at all. In fact, they had all the wrong motivations, and yet still God was doing something that very plainly is the fulfillment of his decree. And okay. so that, that, that greatly increases the um, didactic value, shall we say, of those texts. Okay. And then I also had a quick question about uh, universalism in the Church Fathers. Uh, I kind of uh, ran across a, a fellow classmate from my alum, and he kind of seemed stuck on this, that the Church Fathers were pretty unanimous on unanimous. Uh, universalism. Yeah, unanimous is kind of a laughable thing. But it is. I didn't know if you uh, would have a, a place that you go to in terms of a resource, an article, or anything that kind of deals with that pretty well. Well, no, I... I... Not on universalism. I mean, origins certainly seem to be there. Um, he but, uses Maximus the Confessor and uh, Isaac, I think, as his two. Well, he's area. he's going Eastern Eastern Orthodoxy there. But even then, uh, you know, another good reason uh, to believe in sola scriptura because you can you can make early church fathers say almost anything you want them to say. Um, I I. I certainly have not done almost any reading whatsoever in um, Eastern Orthodox uh, views uh, that could lead to a, an understanding of universalism, but um, certainly there were numerous early church fathers that spoke very plainly of eternal punishment. So the idea of universe, uh, a, a, a unanimity on universalism is obviously false. and. Again, it, it boils back down to what's your source of authority, and uh, the issue is is what the scriptures teach, not not what somebody seven hundred years down the road um, came up with in a, in a theological formulation. So I I don't have anything on universalism in in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. No, that's I I try to stay out of Eastern Orthodoxy as much as possible. Yeah, he's D. B. Hart is his uh, favorite theologian, and. Uh... He's actually leaning towards uh, being a catechumen, I think, with them. So uh, that was part of the reason for uh, that. There you I go. It's, it's influencing him quite a bit, I believe. Uh, well, there's probably more reasons for it than that. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah generally. So, all right. Thanks all right, for your thank call. You, sir. All right. God bless. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thanks for listening to The Dividing Line today. Lots of good calls. Got us through the hour pretty quickly. And Lord willing, we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks a lot. God bless.